Hello, dear brethren, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each one of you. We are here to continue our series, Seven Keys to a Happy Marriage. I pray that wherever you may be, you may feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, that the Lord may bless your family, bless your marriage. Today, we are going to be talking about a topic that uh, it might not sound very attractive, but it's a blessing when we understand it. We are going to talk about self-sacrifice. Uh, last time we had our prayer meeting here, we were talking about forgiveness, the importance of uh, learning how to forgive and also accepting forgiveness, that we all need mercy, that we all uh, need to give mercy and grace and receive mercy and grace. So I hope you have been practicing it, you know, forgiveness in your life, receiving it. Accepting the fact that you also make mistakes sometimes and that you have been able also to practice giving forgiveness, uh, offering forgiveness to others. And today we are going to be talking about self-sacrifice. And I pray that the Holy Spirit may find a place in your heart, in my heart. And when we finish this meeting here, we may finish with the assurance that we met Jesus Christ here at this moment and that he spoke to, to us through his Holy Spirit. Self-sacrifice is something that uh, may even sound a little bit outdated. Uh, psychologists today, when you talk to a psychologist, most of them will say, you know, uh, do what is the best for you. Uh, just be happy and enjoy your life. Don't care about what others say. And that's the advice you receive many times from professionals that they themselves are a little bit confused, but we are going to see what the Word of God tells us about self-sacrifice. Is it really something outdated? Is it something that we should open hands off, or is self-sacrifice still something important for us to practice, especially in our married life? Uh, I'd like us to meditate, to start meditating uh, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 to 28 that we may learn together here today, with the help of the Holy Spirit, this one more key for us to have a happy marriage. And uh, today, I'm going to give you some advice, some counsels here based on the Word of God, based on the guidance of the Holy Spirit and of, of the Bible. And uh, sometimes the Lord will tell us some things here that will cut a little bit of ourselves, that will require some self-sacrifice and we may not like everything we are going to hear here today from the Word of God, but for sure, if we accept it as coming from the Lord and we practice His will, His desire, His advice for us, we are going to enjoy a better life, not only in our marriage, but in all our relationship, we will find uh, that the advice of the Lord about self-sacrifice will be a blessing for us, not just for those around us, but for us, uh, uh, for, for ourselves. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, the word of the Lord there says, but it shall not be so among you. What is Jesus talking about here? For the context, he's talking about the rulers of this world, the people in this world, when they have some power, they really use the power they have in their hands to subdue others, to exercise their dominion upon others. And Jesus, then he comes and says, you know, don't do like them. That should be not so among you. He said, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your servant or your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. So you see here the kingdom of God, the device of Jesus Christ here is completely different from the world. Now, let's think a little bit who you really think will work better, the methods of God or the methods of this world. And Christ is here saying, you know, if you really want to be great, if you want to feel good, feel great and be great, he said, just be a servant. Come to, I, I, and he gives his own example. He continues there and he says, because as the son of man, he's talking about himself. He's saying, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So Christ, he said, I came to serve. I came even to die for you. He said, so I'm just telling you to follow my example and live to serve, to minister to others and not to be served. And how can we apply it to our marriage? How can we apply it to our relationship with our family? And, uh, you know, like there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, Christ 
himself when creating men there, he gave men dominion. And uh, let, let's read Genesis 1, 28. And there it says, and God blessed them. It said, it's God blessed them. It means Adam and Eve. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So God told Adam and Eve to subdue the earth. And then God gave dominion to them. And he said, and I have and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Uh, so God gave Adam and Eve dominion over everything in the earth. All the animals uh, are the fowls, uh, everything that had been created, even upon the earth. God said, you know, subdue the earth. Everything that's here is for you to have dominion upon it. But he said so to Adam and Eve. But one thing is interesting here. God did not tell Adam, you know, you have dominion upon Eve. And he did not tell Eve, you have dominion upon, upon Adam. No, he said, you know, uh, you have dominion upon everything. But when he's talking about the relationship among, uh, between man and woman, then he, said, he explains how it would work. When he created a woman, he explained it. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God said, And the Lord said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So Eve was not created to be subdued by Adam, to be uh, trampled upon by Adam, no. She was created to be his helpmeet, for them to help each other, to grow together, and to help each other, to serve each other, to minister to each other. So that's one thing that's very interesting here, that God gave dominion to them over everything, but among themselves, between themselves, they were supposed to serve each other, to help each other, and they were to represent God to each other, that uh, they would show, that's the God's plan for marriage that man will show his wife how God is love. He is to represent the love. Man, the love of God. So that was God's plan from the beginning. Adam would help Eve. Eve would help Adam. She was created to help him, and they were created to serve each other. And there's something very interesting, brother, in this verse that we just read here. And the Lord God said, "It's not good that the man should be alone." I want to to stress it a little bit here, this part of the, the text as well, that God said it's not good for a man to be alone. So if you have decided to be single for some reason, we respect that. You have the right to be single. But God here, he said, it's not good for the man to be alone. So God created men to constitute a family, to get married, to have a wife, to help him so they could uh, help each other, serve each other and grow together, understanding and showing to, to each other what is God's love. And uh, there in Ecclesiastes also chapter 4 verse 9 says, There are better, two are better than one, because they have a good reward to their labor. So they serve each other, they help each other, they receive and they give to each other. So that was God's plan for men. And God said, it's not good for men to be alone. So as I said, if you have decided to be single, that's your choice. We respect it. But if you are <laughs> waiting to listen, from God, if uh, he wants you to get married or not, if you are waiting for an answer, here's the answer for you today. Maybe there is someone there today that needed to hear that. And if you are wondering, just accept what the Lord is telling you. It's not good for a man to be alone. So if God put there some desire in your heart to get married, that means he wants you to get married because he said it's not good for men to be alone. It's not good for a woman to be alone. So just don't allow that you start looking for that perfect person, the right person to get married. Pray more than ever before. If you want to get married, that's the advice of the word of God. Ask for the Lord to guide you with the Holy Spirit that you may find the person that uh, you are going to make happy that will help you to be happier than you are. 
then uh, go ahead and get married. Because God said it's not good for that man should be alone. God's plan is for you to get married. So if he puts some desire in your heart, if that's the Holy Spirit telling you that that's God's plan for you. If he has some other plan for you, he will not put his desire in your heart. But as I said, don't you look until you find the person that's perfect because there is no such a one. There is no one that is perfect. So you have to learn how to forgive. You have to learn how to grow in love, to accept the person as the person is and work together for you to, to come closer to the perfection in Christ Jesus. But don't keep looking for that perfect person because you will never find someone that's really perfect. So if you find someone that the Lord put in your heart, that's the person that you should marry, you know, go ahead and get married. As the Lord says, look for someone in the Lord and the Lord will work in the life of you too, to serve each other, to make each other happy. But as I mentioned in the beginning, today there, is a, there are two problems, two wrong ideas uh, that's perverting the, wo the, the world. People sometimes they say, you know, I just want to be happy. And that's not what the, the word of God is telling us, that that's not all we should want. Actually, we should be working to make others happy. If we keep looking, if you keep looking just for you to be happy, you'll never find happiness. If that's all that matters for you is for you to be happy, you'll never be happy. Because to be happy, we need to make others happy. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the psychologists today, some of them, not all, some are Christians, they know uh, what they are devising, but some, they are so confused and they tell people, you know, don't worry about others, just worry about yourself, just do whatever you, you want to be happy, whatever you need to be happy, and that's contrary to the Word of God. We need to care about what, what others think. We need to care about what uh, others will feel. So we, we, we need to be careful. If we keep just fighting to be happy, we'll never find happiness. When we live to serve others, then we do as Jesus did. What I'm saying here, if you live to serve others, you are like Jesus. And the power of God flows through you to transform the lives of the people around you. So, serve. Self-sacrifice means to serve. You sacrifice your own desire sometimes to serve your husband. You sacrifice your own desire sometimes to serve your wife. And when you exert this uh, gift that God gives to all of us of self-sacrificing, then a power, a special power from God flows through us. We are just like Jesus, flowing this power of God that transforms life. If you want to transform your husband, you want to transform your wife, you want to see some transformation in your children, let love flow from you by self-sacrificing, by serving. You know, sometimes we, we say, you know, uh, I'm really willing to sacrifice for my family. Uh, the Word of God tells us that we, we should have this agape love for others, unconditional love. And sometimes we think we have it. And we might even have it somewhere there inside of our hearts. But it's amazing how small things that doesn't require us to give our lives just hinder us of showing this love. You know, uh, so that's the message of God to you and to me today. Serve. Ask the Lord for a self-sacrificing spirit, a desire to serve always. There are things that I, I mentioned here are so small. I'll give you some examples. Some couples, they get on a fight because they cannot negotiate who is going to take out the trash, which day uh, they will take the, the, out the trash. And uh, they start fighting for it. Oh, you didn't take out the trash. You should have taken out the trash. Some other people, sometimes they fight because, you know, uh, you come to the mirror in the bathroom and you look at the mirror and it's full of toothpaste that was spilled there when someone was brushing the teeth. Then you are at complaining to your husband, oh, you, you messed up with the mirror, the mirror is full of toothpaste. Toothpaste, I mean, and uh, sometimes you may come to the to bathroom and you find there the sink is all uh, full of water. Someone washed the the face there and mess up there, left it all uh, wet with water spilled on the sink, and you complain about it. Now stop here with me a little bit, and just think: Is it really worth 
the, uh, the stress you go through when you fight, when you complain, you make uh, your husband or your wife unhappy because of some water that is spilled in the sink or some toothpaste the toothpaste that is uh, spilled in the mirror, wouldn't it be much easier, much less stressing just to grab a, uh, a cloth there or some toilet paper and uh, dry the sink or dry or clean the mirror? Wouldn't it be much less energy consuming to clean it than, than start a fight for these small things? Even, you know, uh, the, uh, the toilet seat, Sometimes uh, people complain, oh, you left the toilet seat uh, up or you left, uh, you left it down. How difficult it is, how energy consuming it is, how much energy is going to consume for you to lift uh, the, <laughs> the toilet seat or to put it down. You know, even to clean the toilet sometimes, it's much less energy consuming than the stress of getting into a fight or complaining or making someone unhappy because you complained about their uh, mistake because something they did wrong. Most of the time they didn't even notice. They were with the mind full of something else, concerned about something else, and they didn't even notice that they messed up a little bit with the sink or with the mirror. So is it really worth the stress of a fight for these small things? It wouldn't be much easier just to serve, you know? Clean the mirror, clean the sink, or even the toilet seat if necessary. Serve. That's what the Lord is telling us here, that it's not worth it to be fighting for these things. And he's saying, I came to minister, I came to serve, so follow my example. And that's all Christ is asking you here, telling you, follow my example, serve, and you are going to be happier. Sacrifice one's own interest for the interest of the spouse. It's a, it's a honored way of demonstrating love, demonstrating that you care for that person. So next time, if you have to take out the trash more times than you would like, just do it. It's an honored way of demonstrating that you care for your spouse. Don't fight for these small things. You don't really know what to, uh, all that is going on in the mind of that person. That might be already tired, stressed for some other reasons. Just serve in the power of God that transforms life is going to flow from you at the, as it flew out of Jesus to bless others. So in marriage, many feel that the more a spouse gives sacrificially to each other, the more the spouses give sacrificially to each other, the more their marriage is ideal. So the more you give to your spouse, the more your marriage is going to be what it should be, what God wants it to be. You probably remember some months ago, I think it was in April in your prayer meeting, I, I quoted a law that is there in Deutero Deuteronomy chapter 24 that says that during the first year of marriage, Men would not serve public services, he would not travel, he would not go to war. And it says there, he would not travel in the first year of marriage because his first work was to make his wife happy. Yeah, it's there in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5. You can read it later there. The first year, men would not serve in any work that would require him to travel or to be too involved in the work do military work because his first work during the first year was to make his wife happy. In other words, his first year of married life was for men. His main task was to serve his wife, to minister, to sacrifice his desire and exercise the self-sacrifice to serve his wife. And uh, probably, as I mentioned uh, that month there, if you do something for a year, for sure it becomes a habit. So that was God's plan, that man would serve his wife, work to make her happy the first year of their marriage. So he would got used to it and he would continue serving and making his wife happy for the rest of her life. Today, women have been fighting for their rights. Yes, and they have many rights, many rights that are given by God in his word to women. And uh, their women are strong, sometimes stronger than they think stronger than men sometimes recognize. A wise woman serving her husband, making her husband happy, she can make this man do whatever she wants. And uh, that there is a text in the health reformer talking about the rights of women. 
And I want you, sisters, to think with me here now, to listen to, to the word of God and think about this text here, talking about the rights of women. It says here, it is a woman's right to look after the interest of her husband. So the first year of the marriage, man would learn how to make his wife happy, sacrificing his life for her, give a self-sacrifice in his desire for her. Now this pure process in the right of the woman is to look after the interest of her husband. Can you imagine this kind of marriage that God has planned for you and for your spouse? where the man works to make his wife happy and the wife looks after the interest of her husband. To have a care for his wardrobe. To seek to make him happy. So that's the right of the woman. It's saying here. It's interesting. The Lord's not saying, God's not saying here, that's your duty. It's saying, that's your right to make your man happy, your husband happy. It is her right to improve her mind and manners, to be social, cheerful, and happy, shedding sunshine in her family and making it a little heaven. Oh yeah, that's the, the home that every man wants to come to. A home that is a little heaven. But unfortunately, many homes today, when the man arrives, the wife starts complaining, talk about how hard her day was, how difficult things are, and start complaining and making the man that has been working the, full, the whole day, doing his best to provide for the family. When he gets home, the wife starts complaining. It's just uh, like she's telling him, you know, you are not enough. You are not doing enough. He, he, she doesn't motivate him. She just put him down with her complaints. And the spirit prophet saying, that's the right of the woman to make her happy, a, uh, her home, a hap happy place, a little heaven. And she may have an interest for more than me and mine. We should consider that society has claims upon her. The man has claims upon the wife. The wife has claims upon the man. And it says here, the family, the society has claims upon the wife, the woman, the home. So that's the home. That's God's plan. The man serve his wife. His wife serve him. That's what God wants for your marriage. That your marriage just be a place where you work to make your spouse happy. And you receive the same treatment back. And uh, uh, th th there's a text also in Ephesians chapter 5, 33. That I'd like to analyze with you today here. For us to learn some lessons from this text. The, the text there says, it's a very well known text. Just let's try to extract some new light for us here today from this text. It says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. So it's telling men, love your wife even as yourself. So sisters, you probably like to hear that, right? That uh, men should love you. Yes, and that's what the word of God is saying. That your sp husband should love you. That's your right. That's his duty. That's his right to love you as well. But then it continues and says, And the, the wife, see that she reverence her husband. So you want to be loved, then reverence your husband, says the Bible. And uh, husband, you want to be reverenced by your wife, then uh, love her. And what does it mean to love your wife? What does it mean to reverence your husband? And other uh, translation says, submit to your husband. Um, it, it, what it's saying here is serve your husband. And when it tells the husband to love his wife, it's impossible to love your wife without serving her. So what the Lord is saying here is serve one another. Love your wife. That means provide for her, take care of her, protect her, provide, uh, fight for her, defend her, be ready even to die for your wife. That's what love your wife means. And uh, as I said here, sometimes we say, yes, I'm ready to love, I'm ready to, to die for my wife. But then when it's time for you to remove the trash, more, than you, more times than you'd like, then you complain, you start a fight, and you create a problem at home. It's not uh, asking you to die. Some, most of the time, it's just asking you to remove the trash 
from the kitchen and put it outside. It's just to clean the sink of the bathroom, just to uh, lift up the seat, toilet seat when you are going to use it and lower it down again. Simple things. It's not even ask you to die, but we say, I'm ready to die. But when we are asked to do these small things, we say, no, I'm not ready for it. And we start a fight, we start a complaint. So serve. Serving these small things. And when you subdue yourself, make yourself ready to serve in these small things, it's going to prepare you to treat your spouse with much more patience, with much more love, treat others different. These are simple trainings. Home, marriage is a place where we learn mercy and grace. And we grow in it if we do what the Lord is telling us to do, to serve one another. Dear sisters, when the Bible tells you, uh, reference your husband. What does it mean to reverence your husband? It means to serve him, to respect him, show respect to the man God gave you. Uh, let him be the man. Let him exercise his masculinity. And brothers, coming back to us like, like here, I want to say when I talk about masculinity, some uh, men, they misunderstand it. They think to be macho, to be ma masculine, to be the man, they have to speak louder, they have to to cry, they have to uh, exercise dominion in your situations. No, to exercise masculinity is to provide for your family, to work hard, to get out of the couch and go to work. Stop sitting down and growing a belly and go and work hard to provide for your family and uh, uh, to be ready to do whatever is necessary to provide for your family with the blessings of the Lord. That is to be macho, that is to be masculine in the true sense of the word. So now coming back to the sisters, respect your husband. Let him uh, feel that he is the man that he is needed, that you trust him. Motivate your husband. Tell him he is able to do whatever he plans to do to afford the family. And appreciate when he works hard. Say words of encouragement. Care for your husband. Uh, nurture him and your children. And uh, be, uh, show, serve him with your femininity. No, uh, that, that's something, brother, I, I want to explain it a little bit more here. That's something that is missing nowadays. Sometimes men needs to be more masculine, doing his part. And sometimes women also needs to be more feminine, doing her part, being the woman that the Bible presents, that woman that cares, that is different from a man. Uh, no man wants a woman that doesn't need him, that seems to, to be able to do whatever he, he, he does. Uh, sometimes I give a simple example here, and I want to give this simple example here this moment, you know, for you. Oh, amen. You, you don't understand how happy a man is when a woman tries to open a can, a jar, and she cannot open it, and she gives the jar to him, and he opens it. He feels so proud of himself. He feels that the, his wife needs him, and he feels that he's the man of the house. No man really uh, appreciate uh, a woman that doesn't need him, that, uh, you know, she can do what, uh, everything without him. You know, the men, the men appreciate these small things when he is appreciated, you know, then we, when you motivate him. So sometimes let him open the jar for you. <laughs> and, you know, if you need a tire change it, if he is not around, yeah, sometimes you have to put all the effort and change it. But if he's around, most of the time, if things are going well between you two, it's an encouragement for him when you call him and say, you know, I'm not able to do it. Can you do it? So let him be the man. Respect him when he's talking. Don't cut him. Uh, you know, don't humiliate him in front of your family, of his family, of your friends. Just motivate this man. Reverence your husband. These are simple things. God's not telling you you have to be uh, crucified for your husband. No, yeah, and sometimes you say, I'm willing to die for my husband as well, but in these small things, you fail. So serve your husband in these small things, reverence him. And uh, when you too, when husband and wife do this, when we too do it, the Lord bless our marriage when we serve each other. And I want to close this uh, prayer meeting today here, telling you, uh, reading with you a text from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's uh, Adventist Home. Page 106 says, determined to be all that is possible to each other. 
In other words, the word of God is telling you here, serve always when you can. Do whatever you can to serve your spouse, to make him, to make her happy. Continue the early attentions. Now, those things in the when you are dating, you were you had pleasure to serve each other. You are honored to serve each other, to make the other happy. The Lord is saying, continue doing the same thing. Continue having this happiness to serve. And you are going to see the blessing in your home, in your marriage. You are going to see the miracle of happiness happening in your marriage. In, uh, in every way, encourage each other in fighting the battles of life. Never say uh, words of discouragement, of criticism. The opposite, it says here, encourage each other. Say words of encouragement in the for each other to fight the battles of life. Study to advance the happiness of each other. Yeah, put power, put time to advance the happiness of your spouse. It may require time. It may require some extra efforts, some extra expenses to make your spouse happy. It says here, study to advance. Do whatever it takes to make your spouse happy. Let there be mutual love, mutual forbearance, then marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be as it were the very beginning of love. Yeah, for many couples, dating is beautiful. When they get married, it seems love stopped, finished. And it says here, if you continue trying to make each other happy, serving, self-sacrificing for each other, then it says here, marriage will be as the beginning of love, of the true love that you two are going to grow. It says, if the warmth of true friendship, the love that binds heart to heart, is a foretaste of the joys of heaven. So I pray to the Lord that you may have in your marriage this foretaste of ha happiness, that your marriage may be a happy place, that your marriage may be a, a, pla a place of blessing where your children will grow learning what God love, love means, that you may love each other without measurement, that you may be... Uh, always working, self-sacrificing to make the other happy and you are going to find the true happiness that only God can give. So may the Lord bless you and your family. Amen. So Brian, now I would like to pray for you, for your family, for your marriage. And uh, I, I know some people sometimes they question why uh, we, we, when we are recording some uh, videos or when we are praying here in a live meeting, why we don't kneel down. The case is, I want to explain it here once again. If I kneel down here, I'm going to disappear from the camera and you are go not going to see me praying here. So it is a little bit awkward. But the Bible says that Solomon, when he was dedicating the, uh, the, the temple, he prayed standing and God listened to his prayer. So we have quite a few examples in the Bible when sometimes it's okay to pray standing. Yeah, most of the time in church, at home, we pray um, kneeling down, but there's nothing wrong you know, in some moments of our lives to pray standing. Sometimes I pray sitting in the airplane, I, I pray sitting in the airport, I pray sitting in a bus, wherever I am, if I the Holy Spirit taught my heart to talk to the Lord. I talk to Him in whatever position I may be. So I want to pray with you. Now I'm not going to kneel down. I don't have how to kneel down here at this moment uh, and not disappear from the camera. So I'm going to pray standing. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come in thy presence. Thank you, Lord, for thy message, for thy word, the, for the message you sent to us through the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. Father, forgive our sins. Forgive those moments we did not do what we should have done. And Father, forgive the moments when we said or we did things we should not do. Father, give us the spirit of self-sacrifice, the desire to serve one another. Bless our homes. Bless the couples that are represented here that you may continue working your lives and that each one of us may leave this place, this meeting here today uh, with the desire to serve more, to be, to humble ourselves before you and uh, put ourselves in thy hands to serve others. Help us to serve, especially our spouses, and that this power that comes from you may flow through us to transform the lives of those around us. Father, I ask you to bless every family here. You know some families, some couples here need a miracle. May you intervene in their lives. May you rebuke the enemy and may you bring the miracle they need and make their home, their marriage happy. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. 
So thank you, Brandon, for joining us here. I saw that uh, quite a few Brandon joined us here. I uh, I, I really appreciate you uh, being with us here, Brother Alberto Zayas, Sister Susana Paris, Juan Salazar. Some of you are always here with us. I really appreciate you always participate with us. Jomar Basilan is uh, was here with us as well, and uh, Brother. Gerson Peralta, thank you for joining us. Sister Lazara Tenorio is always here with us. Sister Lena Chaparro, thank you for joining us. Uh, Ethan Mamento, thank you for joining us. Leocardia Salva, uh, Salvatierra de la Cruz is here with us as well. Mariana Dumitro, Sister Mariana, always here also with us. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Jinga Badinis. Costel Bordas, thank you all for joining us here. I will read all the names here after and they'll be praying for all of you and for your families. May God bless you, protect you, and give you the spirit of self-sacrifice. And may you find the happiness that comes from the Lord. Amen.